<laughs> on Wednesdays, we we continue on really with uh, with uh, an extension of what we taught on Sunday. So if you've got your Bible, open up to John eight. Verse 32, we're gonna we're gonna roll all the way to 47. Because I want to take a look at uh, some kind of key areas. We kind of touched on it, but what I want to do tonight is really kind of dive into it. And kind of cover it in depth as they, as they say.
It's the knowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, first and foremost. That's the first thing that he's teaching. And the knowledge that when he is Jesus Christ is Lord, when he is Lord in your life, that changes everything. I had a professor one time in school say, I want you to hear something. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And then he asked everybody in the class, have you heard that before? And everybody goes, well, yeah, of course I heard it before. Yeah, it's the heart of the Bible. John 3, 16. And he says, that has an impact on people, doesn't it? Right? And I went, yeah, of course it does. He said, now, switch out one word. I said, we also have a touch one. He said, for God so loved, instead of the word world, put your name in. For God so loved Matthew. For God so loved Dennis. For God so on and on and on. Now it takes on a whole new meaning, doesn't it? It's not just an academic thing. It's not just a scripture that's on a page. What is it? It's God speaking to you directly. For I so loved you that I gave my son for you that you would have eternal life. And what does that mean? Freedom. Freedom. Bring it home. Make it personal. A lot of folks say, well, no, it's, not, it's not personal. It's personal. It is very personal. It is extremely personal. Jesus had just finished a speech at the temple where he delineated the differences between himself and the listeners. Remember that? In the scriptures we talked about this past Sunday. He did. What did he say? He said, you are from below. And he said, I am from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. Well, that had to absolutely shake him down to the root. Excuse me, what are you saying? I see you right there. You, you look just like everybody else. If you're a man, there you are. are you telling me you're not of this world? And those who knew him a long time, knew him what? As he grew up. That was the problem. Wait a minute. I, I knew you when you were, were 12 years old, you went to the temple, and yeah, you did wipe out the, the uh, teachers there. You blew their mind because they didn't realize, how could he know this? How could he know this knowledge? It's impossible. Because he's not of this world. That's not true. Basically, they were asking the author of the word, how he knew the word. He wrote the book. It doesn't get any better than that. Okay? And so he told them, I'm out of this book. And again, they had a problem because so often we see the tangible. And that's all we can go on as human beings. Just being honest. I got, I got eyes, you got eyes, you got nose, you got a mouth, you got ears. So those are the five senses that God gave every single one of us. And you've lived your whole life using those five senses. You, you survive using those five senses. That's what I brought you here tonight. You got in the car, you turned the key or whatever, okay? You use those. God says, there's something better than that. There's one more. And it's to the believer. And what is it? The power of the Holy Spirit. You can't see it. You can't touch it. You can't smell it. You can't hear it. But it's there. Remember sometimes Jesus would talk about, yeah, we can see it right now. We look outside the window. That tree branch is moving. But well, does that tree alive? Is it able to flex its branch? No. What's moving? Well, the wind. Well, I can't see the wind. But look, it just moved. But I can't see it. See, that was their problem. If I don't see it, it's not real. Folks, <laughs> the Holy Spirit is more real than you and I. I said, standing here, I'm standing here, you're sitting here. He's more real than that. Why? Because he dwells within you. He dwells within you. And that's what gives us our freedom. So, Jesus said, I told you. He said, I told you that you would die in your sins if you do not believe that I am He. You will indeed die in your sins. I'm going to write down John 8, 23 and 24. That's exactly what he's telling them right there. The result of Jesus' message was that even as he spoke, many believed in him. And 
You'll see that in verse 30 as we go through that. Then in verse 31, we get to the end there. Jesus begins to speak just to those who had believed. And what does he say? Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching. Now, this is the key that we're going to take a look at tonight. If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. John 8, 31. What does it mean to hold to a teaching? It means depend on. It means receive it within yourself. It means that is truth with a capital T. How does the world defines truth? True discipleship is more than just an intellectual ascent. It is. It's more than just book knowledge. It's more than me picking up the Bible and, and reading it. No, no. Those who are really followers of Christ will what? Hold to those two words. Hold to what? His word. That means that they will not only accept his teaching as truth, but they will also obey his teaching because action is proof of faith. You might want to write down James 2, verse 17. Action is proof of faith. It is. True discipleship, Jesus believes that he speaks the truth about God and the scriptures. That's the belief that we have it as a believer, okay? They also know that he is he, he is who he claims to be. Now back in verse 25, the people asked Jesus who he was, and he responded, just what I had been telling you from the beginning. What was he telling them from the beginning? He was telling them who he was. He was telling them, I'm the Messiah. I am who, who he is. Now, I find it interesting when I read that, and I go through that scripture where he says, just as I have been telling you from the beginning, that there may be a tinge of uh, exasperation in his response there. At least I'm reading that into that. That's me. I may not be what Jesus meant at all. But, you know, I've been telling you this all the time. You know, because I'm thinking that's maybe how he said it. I don't think he said it that way. <laughs> I would say it that way. I'll just be honest with you. What are you doing? I've been telling you this all the time. You know, He had repeatedly made known that he was the Messiah. The one they had anticipated for many years. And verse 32 begins with these words. Then you will know the truth. The you that's there refers to those who are true disciples of Jesus. Now, again, I want to jump in. The disciple will know the truth. More than that, their eyes are open to a greater understanding of the truth. And I'm going to write down 1 John 5.20, because in 1 John 5.20, it talks about you and I have a greater understanding of God's Word. We do. How many times have you had a person say, you know, I pick up the Bible, I read it, I just don't understand. For the life of me, I, I, I can't figure out what that is. You know, I try to read it, and I open it up, and then, uh, you know, they tell me, okay, start on the, start the New Testament. So I go to this book called Matthew, and I open it up, and the very first thing I start reading is somebody begot somebody begot somebody begot somebody begot somebody, begot somebody begot. And I'm going out of my mind, what does that mean? What is a begot? When you turn your life over to Jesus Christ, God gave you his love. 66 books. Every one of them is extremely important. The whole reason in Matthew about the begotten is he's going through lineage. He's going to lay down something. Flawless. Not a mistake at all. He wants you to know where he came from. And the human lineage from David. He wants that crystal clear. There's no such thing as an, an insignificant book in the Bible or an insignificant paragraph or even an insignificant word. It is all God breathed, the Bible says. And it's important for us to understand. Yes, even Ecclesiastes, even Deuteronomy, to where you go through the law and the law again. And why the, why are you telling me how to build an ark? Okay, why are you telling me how to build a temple? Why, why, why are we going through all this? It is extremely important that we know that. But guess what? As a believer, God will give you insight 
How will he do it? Through the Holy Spirit. How, do, how does he do that? I need to ask him. You've heard me say this before. How do I? How do I read the Bible? How do I go about reading and holding to God's word? First and foremost, I do it by asking him when I open the book, wherever I'm opening the book, if you want to read through the Bible, the Lord, please help me understand what you are teaching me at this time. The Holy Spirit is the one who will show you. The words will jump off the page to you. You will have a greater understanding than you ever had before as a believer. That is the way of reading God's Word. And then when you understand it, what do you do? You'll be able to hold to it. That's what he was talking about. Holding to it. The true Jesus, you know, the true Jesus' disciples receive, bring them what? It brings them freedom. It brings you freedom, it brings me freedom. That's what it does. Jesus continues in the truth of section 3, verse 32. And at that point in history, the Jews were under the rule of the Roman government. Remember? The rabbis were saying, you know, well, we're not a slave to anybody. Really? But did you guys look back in like the book of Numbers, you know, and all these things where you were enslaved by this nation, then you were enslaved by that nation, then you were enslaved by another nation, you went through seven nations, and right now the Roman government controls you? They absolutely do. Rome ruled with a rod of iron. Even though Rome gave them, you know, an exceptionally amount of autonomy, and Rome did, they gave them an autonomy. They were keenly aware of the Roman presence around them in the form of soldiers, governors, and the empirical appointed kings. They were very much aware. They were on a leash. This is all they had. When Jesus said, When Jesus said the truth will set you free, however, like I said Sunday, he was not talking about political freedom. Though the following verses indicate that's how the Jews took it. Remember we talked about that? Well, he's talking about freedom. He's talking about political freedom. No, he's not. He's talking about spiritual freedom. With spiritual freedom brings freedom to the person who lives a spiritual life. And so it begs the question, am I living a carnal life? Or am I living a spiritual life? Am I walking in the flesh? Or am I walking in the spirit? And truth be told, as a believer, remember, we're sinners saved by grace. I'm a sinner. Flat out. And I admit that. But by the grace of God, by God's grace, I am saved. By God's grace, you are saved. And so, I need to walk in the spirit. Yes, do we stray? Remember that uh, hymn that I talked about, prone to wander, because of all of them? But it's sure true. We are prone to wander. We, we just are. It's in our DNA. And it's sad. And I was coming over here the other day, I was driving, and I got to thinking, we went to a funeral. Uh, Kit and I did a, a very good friend of hers. Uh, Kit, uh, for 40 years, was an occupational therapist. And she still uh, practices occupational therapy. She put the company in Chilgawala and has probably three or four clients per week when she would do that too. And uh, I didn't know what occupational therapy was. I thought occupational therapy has prepared you to go back to work, so your occupation I had nothing to do with it at all. No. Occupational therapy is what? How you live. Living is your occupation. Do you have the capacity to put your clothes on? That's occupation. Do you have the capacity to feed yourself? Do you have the capacity to stand up? Do you have the capacity to take a bath? Do you have the capacity to do this? Or that? Or that? Do you have, that's occupational therapy. That's really what it is. It's not going to work. It's living your life so that you what? Can go to work. That was it. Anyway, we went with, to a funeral with a lady who was her executive director for many years. And she passed away about 55 years old. So we got to talk to the family and everything. Uh, there was a young pastor there and did a really good job on the, uh, the message. Zero, you right on Jesus. Word one, boom, right at it. 
very, very good. But uh, we got to thinking when we were talking to her husband, the deceased his husband, and he just made a comment. And, and it, it struck me because he was very straightforward. He said, uh, death is hard. Well, that's an obvious thing. But it looms over us. Because I'm not going to be able to escape that. My body, I'm not going to be able to escape that. Sooner or later, I'm not going to breathe. This heart's going to stop. That's it. This body will die. Because of what? Sin. Corruption. And he said, it's so sad. And when I look at Scripture, as Jesus is talking about, you know, uh, taking hold of his word and so forth and following his word, even to those of us, even to a human being who turns their life over to Jesus. Yes, I know where I'm going. Yes, you know where you're going. You turn your life over to him. When this life ends here, it just begins there. That's where we live. This is kind of like the uh, kindergarten down here. That's the university up there. But the reality of it is, what Jesus is trying to teach is that when you look at scripture and see the shortest verse in the Bible, you know what that is? Two words, right? Jesus, right? Even when he saw Lazarus, Lazarus, and he raised him from death, he was weeping. And I love the point in scripture where it says, Oh, he loved him so, that's why he's weeping. In about four minutes, he's going to raise him from the dead. So why is he weeping? He's weeping because of death. Because death entered in. Death is, was not what God wanted. It was what man brought upon himself. That was not God's choice. That was, unfortunately, that was our choice. It, it's, it was alien, basically, what it was. It was not in. It was not supposed to be. But mankind made a choice, and that choice separated him, them, from God. And so the weeping, like that man the other day, he was weeping over his wife. Yes, ran right from the soul. But he was weeping about death itself. He says, "It's it's wrong, and it is wrong." But when you look at God's word. As we go through this, the freedom that we have, that he's talking about here, is liberation. And here it is, it's liberation spiritually from this body to eternity. When I, when I leave this body, when you leave this body, you're free. You are free. That's it. Oh, when you take a look at Paul, 2 Timothy, they call that his swan song. You know, the very end, the very last thing he was going to say. What did he say to Timothy? I have fought the good fight. I have run the race. There's laid up for me a crown of glory. Basically, he was saying, "You're going to, you're going to cut my head off, and the second my head leaves my body, I'm free." How do you, how do you handle a guy like that? What are you going to do? Are you going to kill me? Go ahead, kill me. The second you kill me, I'm free. That's the, the attitude, if I may be so bold, the strength in knowing, really knowing where you're going, really knowing Jesus Christ, really holding to that word. That's strength that the world doesn't have. They'll offer everything in the world. They'll offer you everything. They'll offer you fame, fortune, money, you name it, the whole shot. Guess what? It stays here. It can't buy what you have and what I have as a believer. And what is that? Heaven. Can't buy it. Can't touch it. Not at all. Jesus, when he said it was the truth, <laughs> it was the spiritual truth. Jesus provides the best commentary for his own statement 
in verse 34, Jesus explains, Verily, truly, I say to you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. See, being a slave to sin is the ultimate bondage. And it is. The freedom Jesus offers is a spiritual freedom from the bondage of sin that is released from the lifestyle of habitual lawlessness. Every believer is a sinner. Right? Like I said, you know, we're saved by grace. And you've heard me use the phrase before, it wasn't original with me. As a believer, you're not sinless, you sin less. Hmm. But here's how that goes. If I follow, if I have a daily diet of this word, the more of this word that I get in here and in here, the less and less and less I'm going to want to sin against it. Does that make sense? So here you go. As a believer, you're not sinless. You sin less and less and less and less and less. What is it doing? It's not doing this. It's doing this. Now, I will not reach a perfection in this Bible. There's no way that I can. The Bible does not teach that at all. But guess what? I need to measure myself um, in a house. We've got a door that we open up there. We measure Annalise, she's seven years old. Hey, everybody done that? And the kid, you know, put the kid up against the door and put the pencil mark there, put the date on it, you know, when they're this high. And I think she's grown like an inch and a half in two months. They explode. I have no, it's gotta be in the food. It's gotta be something. Okay, it's like, you are. She, all of a sudden she gets hungry, she starts eating a lot of food, and right away kid will go, a growth spurt is about to happen. Okay, next thing you know, her pants are this short on her, says, what happened? But we grew, she grew, here's my point. Where is my measurement? Where is your measurement? Do I measure myself, my spiritual growth? I can't measure it up against a wall with a pencil. But how can I measure it? I measure it against who I was, who I am, and who God is bringing me to be. I measure it against what does the Word say? Here's my life. Here's the Word. I need to measure against that. I need to look at it. Lord, true freedom is me being in line with this. So I measure myself. It's a good idea to take inventory, spiritual inventory of yourself. It doesn't mean become legalistic, no. But it does mean check. Check yourself. Check. You know, we'll go to a doctor for a checkup or something like this. Um, the doctor has a kit now, like every uh, what is it? six months ago. Every six months we'll go back in and they'll say, okay, let's go to. Uh, you know, Quest Diagnostic, and they're going to draw blood. Everybody go to Quest Diagnostic, that's where they get the blood. Yeah, Quest Diagnostic. We'll do a blood panel on you. We'll check you out, because if they take your blood, they can pretty well see every single thing going on in your body. They know the white cell count, the cholesterol, they got it all. Check. So physically, this is who you are. And he'll show you, he'll show a graph. Okay, this is who you are. This is who you are. Okay, this is looking better than this. Or this is, you need to, not do this so that this becomes better. See what I'm saying? Why don't we do that spiritually with our own lives against the Word of God? I need to check myself against that. That's not becoming legalistic. It's, it's simply saying, I want to do that so that my I live more in the Spirit than I do in the flesh. That's really all they say. The freedom that Jesus offered is a spiritual freedom from bondage, basically. He continues with the analogy and he says, now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. That's in verse 35. Remember we talked about, maybe he's talking about maybe Isaac and Ishmael, like we talked about Sunday. He may have been picking up on that. The people would have understood Jesus to mean that they were not members of God's family, despite their biological relationship to, to Abraham. 
That's in verse 37. Because they were what? Slaves to sin. If they were to become you know, disciples of Jesus, they would know the truth and the truth, con true condition of their heart and the true condition of who Jesus really is. Believers would be freed from their bondage and brought into the family of God. Jesus is the truth. John 14, 6. That's what that says. And it says it throughout the Bible. Jesus is the truth. Now, let's unpack this for a second. Knowing the truth will set one at liberty. Free from what? Free from sin. Free from condemnation. And free from death. Romans 6, 22 and Romans 8, 1 and 2 says that, okay? The big word in there is the condemnation. Condemn. Satan always wants to hold you under condemnation. Look what you've done. Look what you've done. You've heard me say this before. It's not look, look, look what you've done or look what you can do. It's look what he did on Calvary. That's the answer right there. Jesus claimed. There we go. Jesus came to proclaim liberty to the captives. Luke 4, 18. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. 1 Peter 2, verse 16. The ESV translation is there. That's a great verse of scripture. I, I, and I need to do that. Live as people who are free. <clears throat> do I live as a person who is free in Christ? Do you live as a person who is free in Christ? Those are heavy-duty questions that we have to ask ourselves as we take a look at this. So let's Let's do some observations. <coughs> How about this one? I love this. Many years ago, let's see if I can get that. There we go. Peter Marshall, the U.S. appointed chaplain, said, quote, the choice between us is plain. Christ or chaos? Conviction or compromise? Discipline or disintegration? He's a wise man. That's where society is at. We're out of the cusp of it right now. And to not see that is blindness. The world doesn't see it because it doesn't want to see it. Don't tell me I'm doing wrong. Everything is right. It doesn't work that way. I love the words of former president, Ronald Reagan. Reagan said, without God, there is no virtue because there is no prompting of the conscience. Without God, there is a corrosing of society. Without God, democracy will not and cannot long endure. If we ever forget that we are one nation under God, then we will be a nation gone under. Man, man, he nailed it. And that was a long time before now. That was decades ago. That is so true. And that's what we are as a nation. We, we don't want God. The nation doesn't want God. But I praise God that there is a force that is here on this earth that Dennis has talked about many times, and that is the Holy Spirit. You ever wonder what is holding back the wave of evil? It's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, and guess what? He's in you and me. What does that mean? You are an agent that God wants to use to be able to what? Thwart the schemes of the devil. To be able to share light and life with people. To be able to set them free by the gospel. You have that capacity. I have that capacity. See, there's a great difference between freedom and license to do what I please. It's a huge difference, sir. A big, big difference. You come out here and I'll read it. For instance, how much freedom will be there be driving through LA with no traffic signs, no traffic lights, no speed limits, no traffic officers? Oh, that'd be so free! <laughs> a lot of accidents. And you would have a pile up on every freeway the likes of which you could not. But if you got, you thought you were in a traffic jam now, it would be a 24-7 chaos. On the streets of LA, 
it would be a nightmare. Right? It would be pure chaos. Well, what kind of freedom would that be? You know, how, how much freedom would that be? How about this? How much freedom would there be in a math class with no right or wrong answers or a spelling class that allows a student to spell creatively? Oh, Johnny, you did a good job there. That was a creative way, so we're going to give you a B. No, you spelled it wrong, sir. This is how it's supposed to be spelled. Okay? <laughs> but no, it's okay. You know, we'll give, we'll give you a trophy for showing up. No. There's no trophy for showing up. Uh, most of us live in a, gen in a generation where you didn't get a trophy for showing up. Uh, there was a big winner. There was a loser. There was one who was, you know, had a high grade. There was one who had lesser than a high grade. But guess what? It depended upon you. It depended upon me. You do the work. You do the study. You get the grade. What a concept. How much freedom would there be in that? How about this? How much freedom would there be in a society with no limits but the strongest rule over the weakest ones. That's what would happen immediately. It would be chaos. Third world countries. Uh, do we know of a country that does that? We talked about this morning. Haiti. Haiti. Uh, there's chaos in there. And the, you know, the police are outgunned, outmanned. A lot of times the people have finally rallied together and taken sections of the city back. But it is that. That's what that is. Lawlessness. No, no protection whatsoever. The strong one will survive. The weak one will die. That's you know the, the, that is a that is a, a a life in the animal kingdom. You are not an animal. I am not an animal. We are human beings made in the image of God, and there is there are rules. There are things that we need to follow. And this is what the important thing. And this is what Jesus was talking about when he talked about freedom. Specific types of freedom. Okay? True freedom must always be lived within what? Limits. You gotta have limits. You gotta have what? Boundaries. This is important. Without boundaries, you got chaos. When you came here today, you got in your car, you were driving. A little line down the middle of the road. Why do I pay attention to that? Why don't I just go on the other side of the road? I can't. No problem. Until that semi comes right at me, then I got a problem, okay? That line says, you stay here, they stay there. It's nice and safe. As soon as you cross over, you got a problem. What? You've broken a boundary. This is it. You can't do that. True freedom must always be lived in limits. God's word tells us in Galatians 5, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourself be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. End quote. Don't let that happen. In 1 Peter 2.16, you might want to write down, 1 Peter 2.16 we read, Live as free men. But do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Mm -hmm. Live as a servant of God. Mm -hmm. Don't just use it as a, as a license, basically. We are living. We are living in a world of relativism, where many deny that there is a set of standards of truth, of right or wrong. This is where we are. This is where we are today. We have been there for some time. It just didn't happen today. It's happened over decades. And we can go back and take a look at the, the teachers that are teaching in the schools, the teachers that are teaching in the universities. And there is no truth with a capital T. There's your truth. And there's my truth. And you can have your truth as long as it doesn't interfere with my truth. And I can have my truth as long as it doesn't interfere with your truth. You see, it's situational truth. That's what we're looking at today. The world that we are living in basically is saying that. This is what it is. That there is a set of standards and truth of right or wrong. The world in which we live in is tricked into believing the falsehood. Truth is what? Relative. 
It's a relative truth. And that's what it is. It's always dependent upon what? The person and the situation. That's what truth is. I love to talk about those guys one time and bring them up on top of the roof here and say, okay, here's the relative truth. I'm going to push you off the top of this building. My truth says you're going to hit the ground. You're going to splat. It's going to be the end of it. What does your truth say? You can hold to that to a certain degree, and then finally, it breaks down. When does it break down? When gravity takes a hold. That's true. There is no getting around that. And as gravity is true, and we know that it is true, guess what? Jesus Christ is truer than that. Why? He created it. He brought it into being for a reason. But there are people that say, you know, that's okay. Many have gone along with that lie that what is true for you might not be true for me. In our lifetime, in your lifetime and in my lifetime, okay, we have seen a mock effort to totally disregard God's Ten Commandments and His Word. We have. You have. I know we have. And it's a chipping away of it constantly. That's why I love what happens here at Higher Ground with the teachings that we do on Sunday and Wednesday and the teaching we do in the School of Ministry with Dennis and with Neil. What is it? Thy word is truth. Here's truth. Let everyone else be a liar. This truth will not change. It is not subject, subject to change. It is not subject to situations. God will always be God. Jesus will always be Jesus. When, G when God says no, he doesn't mean maybe. He means no. When God <laughs> says yes, he means yes. It's just that simple. In fact, what does the Bible say to the believer? Let your yes be yes and your no be no. What a concept. If we could only put that on a plaque and bring it to Congress, all this stuff would be over with in about 10 seconds. But no, they will not go hold to that. Why? Well, if you're yes, I'm not really my yes. And I, I think that we can just come together and we can come somewhere in the middle. No, yes is yes and no is no. And that's, that's the freedom in that. I love the story. Martin Luther, I thought about the reformer. Martin Luther grew up tricked. I use that phrase there into the slavery that comes with not knowing the truth. Not knowing the truth, okay? He grew up afraid of God and thinking that he had to do something, what? To please God by his own action. And he lived a life as a priest trying to do that. Uh, they would, he would pray for hours on his knees on stone until his knees bled. He would take a, a, a whip and he'd be whipping himself to keep the body in check and bleeding so that he would be under submission, bringing the body under submission. So this is what he did, and this is what that practice was, okay? The Church of Luther's day had certainly strayed far away from the truth, with many man-made rules and practices based on the law, with little or no teaching of the gospel at all. Hardly any at all. The whole point of, and I won't get into church bashing here, but the whole point is this. At that point, only the priests could read the word of God. It was in Latin. So what did we do? And I remember as a little kid, I grew up in New York, and I told you, we, we were two first. Christmas and Easter, we go to, we go to Mass, Christmas and Easter. And I go to Mass with my dad. And in those days, like I said, it was in Latin. The service was in Latin. And I'm sitting there, and that man up there is saying a language I have no idea what he's saying. And I turn to my mom and go, What's he saying? I didn't know what he was saying. My mom didn't know what he was saying. My dad didn't know what he was saying. Probably 99.9% of the people in the congregation, unless you, in those days, you could speak Latin, he didn't know what he was saying. But every now and then, he would stop, and he would say, and the Lord bless you. Oh, I got that one. And the Lord bless you. And he returned that back to him. That was it. That was the whole service. And that was it. As Martin Luther was, you know, he, they had the word of God in that time. They did, but here's the thing. 
They had God's word, but they certainly weren't what? Holding to it. They weren't holding to it. There was Martin Luther was preparing a lecture to teach, and we know the story, it was on the book of Romans. He was, you know, thought to study God's word and the truth of God's word really set free. It's exactly what it did. You know the story. He studied the word of Romans, Romans 1. And in it, reading in there, Romans 1, 16 and 17, it says, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes. And then he goes further and then he says here, for in the gospel our righteousness from God is revealed, our righteousness that is from faith to faith, just as it is written. And then these six words jumped off the page to him. The just shall live by faith. That hit him like a Mack truck. What do you mean? The just shall live by faith. Faith alone? Yes, faith alone. You don't need all the other stuff. You will never work your way into heaven. No matter how many times you go on your knees and your knees are bleeding. No matter how many times you beat yourself. That is not going to get you into heaven. That's not going to please God at all. You are in bondage. You're not free, Martin. The truth shall set you free. The righteous, the just shall live by faith. And as we read in the study for this evening, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by observing the law. Rather, through the law, we become what? Conscious of what? Sin. The law will only show you how bad I am and how bad we are. That's what the law does. There's no mercy in law. None. You broke the law, you pay the price. That's it, okay? As, as we read this evening, it, it basically says that. But now a righteousness from God apart from the law has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This is what God was talking about when he said, said being set free. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. That's Romans 3, verses 21 through 24. Romans 3, verses 21 through 24. I kind of put this thought up here. When Martin Luther read that, oh man, how freeing that was for him to read. Don't you think so? That hit him like a bolt of light. But there are so many churches and viewpoints today how can a person know the truth? How can you know the truth? How can I know the truth? Well, you've heard me say this before. You get a job in a bank. How do they know the difference between a counterfeit bill and a real bill? Do they spend time studying all the counterfeit bills that are out there? No, you have to, you have to spend day and night, and then there's always a new counterfeit, so you have to study that one too. No, just look at the real $20 bill. Study the $20 bill. And once you've studied the real thing, you can spot the counterfeit like that. And what is the real thing? Right there. It's the real thing. Truth. This is what Jesus was referring to when he said that. Plain and simple. In much the same way Jesus would have us living in his word or holding to his word. This is what we're talking about as we close this up. Spending so much time in the truth of the word, making it such a part of our lives that error is easily recognized because it does not fit with the known truth of God's word. I will spot the truth. And I will know the truth. And the truth will set me free from what? It will set me free from error. What's error? Sin. The more truth that I know, the more will God's word I know. Remember? You will sin less and less and less. You're not going to reach the point where you're perfection. No. I told you the story. I, got, I was at a conference at Atlanta, Georgia, and I had a pastor pick me up. And this was a, uh, it was a fundamental church. So it's like recovers the Bible, the, the maps, everything. It's all God, fundamental. Beautiful people. But this particular brother picked me up. And he drove me from the airport to, to the hotel. And he turned to me halfway there and said, "Brother, I'm having such an incredible day." I said, "What's what's what happened? Tell me." He says, "I have not sinned all day long." 
<laughs> he just did. Oh, oh. <laughs> I, I didn't want to break his heart to say, guess what? You just did? <laughs> so I go, that's nice. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't want to hurt you, but you just sinned by saying that. What? Right. You boasted. Oh, man. I'm juice. I'm done. That's it. Okay. Here's the bottom line. As they say, let's cut to the chase. Jesus says, hold to my truth. Te- hold to my teaching. Continue in my word. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. What? Free from sin because of Jesus' death and resurrection. Free to serve freely, teaching and living according to what? The truth of God's word. That's what it does. So, tonight as we take a look at this, what are some of your thoughts as we wrap through this? There's a lot here tonight, I know that. But just to be able to kind of see, God, what did I what did I grab a hold of tonight uh, in my head? in my heart uh, about leaning into God's word about following the truth yes it is you know my slide there has me kind of thinking and there's this idea that when you are not free there are chains on you there are things holding you there are things restricting you and as God's truth sets you free those things that are holding you back, those things that are restricting you are removed. And you are then free to serve God. Your guilt, your sin, your past have been dropped. And Satan cannot use those to enslave you again to hold you back from serving God. That's a big one. That's one of the big it's that word condemnation. That is out of the probably the, the top five that he uses, that's right up there. And he hasn't changed in 6,000 years. It's the same game. He just modernizes it and puts, you know, he gives it a new face to It's the same old jump. But yeah, you were set free for freedom's sake in order to do what God desires for you to do. As a side note, can you imagine how infuriating? That is to say, because he thought, I got you. Now all of a sudden you turn your life over to Christ. Well, I, I still can influence you, but guess what? His influence becomes less and less and less. The more and more and more I have that in my soul and in my mind. Doesn't mean I'm perfect. Oh, Lord, no, I'm not. But guess what? Less. I'll say less and less. That's one of the big ones. What are some little thoughts? Everybody raise your hand. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, one thing I right, it's kind of a tangent, but I, I like to hear in verse 29, I have the New Living Translation, it says, uh, uh, verse 29, and the one who sent me is with me, he have not deserted me, for I always do what pleases him. I think that verse right there is like a beautiful indication of the Trinity. Relationship between God the Father and Jesus the Son, because He was saying, I do what pleases Him, He sent. So, and I, I don't think they were like understanding like, who sent. Yeah, No, my heavenly Father. Because earlier He said, I'm from above, you know, from below. Right. So it's kind of like a nice little. Oh yeah. Should be explanation there. And I love that line. I always do. Father wants. I wish I could say that, but I can't. I don't always do what my Heavenly Father wants. He could. He could say that. Why? He's perfect. I'm not. But praise God. Guess what? He gives you and I the ability to please the Father more than less. He gives you the ability to please the Father even more. God gives you abilities to do things for Him. And as Dennis mentioned, the more shackles that are broken in the law of you, the more free that you are to be able to do what He wants you to do. Uh, 1929, I think I told a story before, it's a man with a very little. He was a missionary to China. 
And he was in the Olympics. He was a runner. Incredibly fast. Uh, long story short, he they did a special run because he was not supposed to run on Sunday. He couldn't run on Sunday because he wasn't going to do that, right? But he did win, and he went to China for many years, lived his life there. And it was asked of very little, what do you what do you think of what God has done in your life? Now in those days a reporter would actually ask that kind of question. Today, no reporter is gonna ask that question. I may be dead wrong, but that's it. And Derek Little said, God has made me fast, and when I run, it pleases. Mm. End of story. God has made you fill in the blank. And when you use the blank, it pleases. How pleasing am I? How pleasing are you? Not to each other. We want to be pleasing to each other, of course. How pleasing are we to Him? When we use what He has given us, it pleases. Derek hit it right on the head. His gift, among other gifts, was speed. He was incredibly fast as a human being. That's why he said, God made me fast. And when I run, it pleases him. Oh, that we would please God and use the gift that God gave you. Nobody can take your place. There's only one of you. You're not one in a billion. You're one in seven billion. We'll never forget that. Without another one like you on the planet. You know, we joke, we say, God made him or made her, he broke them all. He did. They said, we'll do one of you. What are you doing with the one? What are you doing? What are you doing with what he's given to you? They said, well, you know, uh, I, I, I'm older, I can't do that. Really? Take a good look at that book and read through the times and the things that God has used for people that way past what we would think be, you know, the usable age. We have a, a tendency to say, well, when you're 20s and 30s and stuff, God can use you. Yes, he can use you. Sure he can. But guess what? If you read the stories of those in that book, you see where God used people in their 50s and 60s, older and older. Why? He had a plan. And they didn't reach it. They didn't reach where God wanted until they got that age. Then God used it. They weren't ready yet. You're not ready. You're ready. God's called you. You're ready. Let's please Him with the gift that we have. Any other thoughts? Yes. As I read this, I see kind of a mixed group there because uh, it says in uh, verse 30 uh, as He spoke these things, many came to believe in Him. And then he was speaking directly to those Jews who had believed in, in him. If you abide in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Then in verse 33, my Bible says, they answered him. So the, the they there uh, would be part of those that don't believe in him, I would suppose, but who are overhearing him speak directly to those who did. So so he took special care to address those who believed in him oh, and, and spoke to them specifically. God, scriptures speak to you specifically where you are and what you're doing and why you're doing it. Specifically. God will leave them. That's that verse that jumps off the page. It only jumps off the page to you. Not the next person. Just to you. He's got speaking to you. Specific. Just like he said, he spoke to them. God knows his children. He knows. My sheep know my things. They hear me. They do. The more we hear his voice, the more we will recognize his voice over the noise of the world, over the noise in our own head, and be able to follow. And when we follow, it's pleasing to the It is. Anybody else? Yeah, it is. I was just going to say.
say you mentioned about God breaking the mold. And for many years when I was in the Christian faith and just getting started, I kept feeling like I did not fit the mold for Christians. And God finally set me down one day and says, I don't use molds. I'm a creator. I'm an artist. I sculpture. And so each one of us is custom made what God wants us to be. There's only one. And so I asked one time. If you're not going to be you, who's going to be you? There's only one. There's only one. What's the thing that Chuck used to say? I hope I get it right. Only one life to live. And soon we pass. Only what's done for Christ will last. That's true. You know, not taking away from our abilities as human beings, your ability, your profession, your intellect. It's not shutting that down. It's saying this. One of the things done for Christ in the last life is one of the things done for Christ that going to go into each other. Say, ah, this beautiful building a thousand years from now, Christ carries and waits another two thousand years to get what he does. But you won't. There's a difference. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for tonight. Help us, Lord, to live in the freedom that you give given us as freedom in Christ, freedom to break the bonds of the things that would hold us so that Christ could use us even more. Help us in doing this, Lord. I thank you so much for the beautiful people here tonight. I thank you for those who are online. We're going to be seeing this tomorrow, Lord. And so we just ask your blessing. We ask in Jesus' name. Together we said, Amen. Amen. God bless you guys.